Welcome to our parent education series sponsored by Connick and Associates. I'm Dr. Lisa Connick. I am a clinical psychologist and founder of Connick and Associates, which is a group practice specializing in child and family behavioral health and psychological assessment services. Uh, we are providing important information and resources to individuals and families in our community through our autism awareness and parent education series. And this is the second segment of our series for Autism Awareness Month. Its title is Educational Supports from Childhood through College and Beyond. Today, we have an expert panel of educators and individuals in the field of education who are gonna to speak to you about their expertise in working with individuals on the autism spectrum. And I'm going to introduce each of our panelists today and have them speak a little bit about themselves and their organization. The first is Brianne Jonathan, Director of the Autism Initiative and Pathways Program at Aurora University. Welcome, Brianne. Thank you, Dr. Connick, for having us today. Um, yes, I'm the Director of the Autism Initiative at Aurora University, and we have some really exciting programming um, much of which is beginning this year um, for students uh, beginning their sophomore year of high school and continuing on um, through high school and through the transition to college and during their college years. And then um, we also pay particular attention to that transition into the workforce as well. Great, thank you, Brianne. We also have with us Wanda Malone. Wanda is a bilingual IEP coach and advocate and owner of Wanda Malone Educational Services. Thank you, Dr. Connick, for having us. As um, you mentioned, I am a bilingual special needs mom, primarily, and IEP coach and advocate. So I provide services nationwide to families navigating the overwhelming process of the IEP and 504. And I speak English and Spanish. Thank you, Wanda. We also have Carrie Provenzali, Executive Director at the Turning Point Autism Foundation. Hi, Dr. Connick and everybody. So nice to be here during Awareness Month. Turning Point Autism Foundation is a nonprofit in Naperville, but we serve about a one mile or one hour radius around Naperville with programs from seven years old all the way up into adulthood. So you can find more information at turningpointautismfoundation.org. Thanks, Carrie. We also have Peppy Silverman, who is the Director of Bridge Educational Advocacy. Hi, Dr. Connick. Thank you for putting together this wonderful panel presentation. I am the Director and Founder of Bridge Educational Advocacy. Um, I support students and families who may be experiencing difficulty working collaboratively with their school team. That's inclusive of students with special needs, certainly inclusive of students who uh, are being served based on a disability of autism. But I also su provide support for students and families who might not be um, served under special education. So any type of school issue in which the family does not feel that the school is working collaboratively with them. Thanks, Peppy. And we also have Camille Smith, Vice President of School Programs at Little Friends. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Connick, for sponsoring this Autism Awareness Series. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, our agency, Little Friends School Programs, uh, supports two school programs. One school is our Kretze Academy. We serve students ages three through 21 on the autism spectrum. Uh, we also serve students who uh, have a variety of diagnoses, including OHI, ED, um, and then we also serve students in our Mansion High School program who are diagnosed with social emotional challenges, anxiety, depression, and school avoidance. Um, these are students who are working on age appropriate academics and our information will be in the chat box. Thank you. Yes, and our, our panel presenters are putting all of their contact information in the chat and we will get that to you at the end as well. Um, so we have a couple of, uh, our goal today is to provide a general overview of educational supports from the early childhood through post high school stages. 
And we have a lot of information to cover in a short period of time. So please feel free to ask questions throughout the talk if um, there are some topics that we didn't get to that you're particularly interested in. And I will be monitoring the chat um, and also making sure if anyone's joining late, we will certainly welcome them in. Uh, we'll start with early education. Um, if a parent, one of the questions that we had presented to us was if a parent has concerns about their child's early developmental milestones, how can parents reach out to their school districts to determine if a screening might be necessary? And we see this a lot with our, our clients and that's often a, a question that comes up. Uh, perhaps the advocates that are here could speak to that. Um, I'll start. Uh, students um, can potentially receive school-based services as early as their third birthday. But in order to be prepared for that third birthday, um, school districts should be working uh, in conjunction with early intervention services, even notifying the community at large, reaching out to preschools, um, so that if there is a concern, as you mentioned, um, families can reach out to their school districts um, with children as young as two and a half. Many school districts do preschool screenings and those preschool screenings can be a part of an evaluative process. But if a student has received supports through early intervention services, so birth to three, um, that agency should be helping to make connections. But if you feel as a parent that that connection hasn't been made, you can reach out to your local school district to initiate that process. And I can also add to um, what Pepe just mentioned. Again, early intervention is key, right? Um, we want to make sure if you are in doubt, you want to make sure you get your student evaluated just to rule out anything. If they need supports, um, again, as Pepe mentioned, the school can do that. I get a lot of parents that are not even aware of early intervention. They just come to me and say, four, I think he has a learning disability, not sure what. And so I can help them through that process, making sure that they're aware. So we reach up to the school and make sure that they uh, receive a comprehensive evaluation and then determine if the student is actually eligible for special education services or a 504. Um, so making sure that parents are aware that early intervention is key. When in doubt, as a special needs mom myself, make sure that you rule that out as early as possible. And just for those who may be questioning, what are some of those supports that a student might get at that early stage? So it could be uh, speech therapy. It could be physical therapy. It could be occupational therapy. Um, it could be uh, targeted instruction. So there are most school districts either themselves or through uh, special ed cooperatives have preschool classes that are taught by special ed teachers. Um, there are many programs that are called blended programs. So some of the students might be typically developing peers and some of the students might be students um, who've been identified as having a disability. But it turns out that having an integrated program with therapists and teachers can be good for all kids. So there are many families who seek out those services, um, those kinds of blended programs, even if their children are not having any um, developmental delays. That's a good point. Thank you for that. And this is a question for everybody. What are some of the challenges you see for students with autism in the general education setting? Um, I, I don't mind getting started on this. Um, although I'm at the higher ed level now, I also have a background in K-12. And I think one of the biggest things that we see falls under the umbrella of executive functioning skills. And so um, there's often um, delays or um, struggles with executive functioning. And I think it affects um, almost every area of schooling. So some folks think, think it's only academic related, which it definitely affects academics, but it also affects the ability to know when to self-advocate, um, when to, how and when to problem solve with peers. Um, and so I think it's, that is one of the biggest things, especially coming to the college level that is sort of expected and many of our students um, on this spectrum have struggled with that for a long time and there's um, big gaps and what I've noticed is much as as the last answer sort of got at is the earlier it can be addressed the better 
for executive functioning skills. Brianne, I would add to that as well, that you make such a great point about the executive functioning, especially as you're looking at students and young adults coming into your program. As I listen to some of our parents um, talk about the concerns that they've expressed, some besides the executive functioning, some simple things that seem simple to us, but are not simple to our students, transitions in the hallway. Um, the, the number of people, the amount of sound is sometimes overwhelming for our students. Um, going to the cafeteria for lunch or going to PE and changing for PE can be very um, dysregulating for, for some of our students. Um, some of the, um, the, the, the opportunities for sensory um, strategies that we have in our setting in a non-public setting um, we're, we're very rich with those different opportunities to ex experience sensory um, opportunities for calming. And I think that um, those are some of the things that we hear from our parents. And I would also wanna add, um, when we think about school, um, teachers present information by talking and students demonstrate their knowledge by responding. And so if the social dynamic of communication or sometimes referred to as social pragmatics, um, that is a dynamic, ever-changing, complex environment uh, that changes as our own children change. It changes with one teacher to another. And so being able to navigate those social interactive environments, whether it's a math class or a lunch period, um, can be particularly challenging for students with autism. And I think Lisa, to your question, what challenges, it really depends, right, on the student's ability. That's why there's a spectrum. So depending on what end of the spectrum the student is, those challenges may be different. But I think everything that everybody has mentioned has been um, pretty um, common that we see, right? But a, one of the things that I see more often, and I don't like to use the term high functioning, but a lot of the students with high functioning, as Brienne mentioned, the executive functioning, that receptive and expressive language is not always there. So that becomes a huge challenge. But even though that student can, you know, have conversations, but when they're in that frustration and that level of that mode, they can't express themselves. And we see a lot of behaviors. So those are, as Pepe mentioned, that social pragmatic, they don't know how to adjust well. Um, and those are some of the challenges that I'm seeing, but really with the receptive and expressive is a big one along with the executive functioning as well. Thanks ladies. Let's speak for briefly about IEP. And I know we could have an entire discussion on IEP planning and 504 planning. Can you briefly explain how a parent might navigate the steps for special education services? And when does that become, what is an appropriate time for them to consider that? Anytime they suspect that there is a concern. Um, put it in writing, request to have a comprehensive evaluation. In the state of Illinois, they have 14 days to respond to indicate if they are gonna meet. And there's a process. I'm not gonna go through the whole process because it is lengthy, but you initiate by requesting an evaluation. And then the team comes together to do that evaluation and indicate what areas of concern. It's really important that the evaluations are done are in the areas of suspected disability or areas that could impact adversely in the educational area. Um, and once they go through that, then they have an obligation to meet with the results and the team. And again, an important component that parents need to understand, they're an equal member of that team. So their voice is very important. Their parent input needs to be taken into consideration. Their parents, they may not be the educators, but they know their student, they know their child. So making sure that they feel it as an equal member. And then an IEP is created if one is um, needed for that student. So it could be a process, there is a lengthy process, um, but the first initiation is a written request to be evaluated. And I would just add one other piece. I agree with everything that Wanda shared. Um, she mentioned putting your request in writing I would add that all communication that you have with the school team be in writing. So if you have a great conversation with the teacher or a principal, later that afternoon, 
sent an email saying, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciated that we talked about this and this and this because you've created uh, a paper trail in email counts as a piece of paper. When you go to a meeting and you wanna share all that you know about your child or all that you're concerned about with your child, put it in writing and ask that it be added to the notes of that meeting so that your words aren't paraphrased by someone else who might be taking notes and who might not capture um, everything in the way that you said it. So keeping in mind that your communication becomes uh, more validated when it's in writing. Thank you, ladies. Um, the next question, what if the public or traditional school setting is not able to meet the needs of the student? What is the process of seeking a therapeutic school setting and when would that be appropriate? And this is an interesting question because a lot of times my practice does diagnostic assessments and we may give a diagnosis of autistic spectrum disorder. And then immediately the family says, we need therapeutic school. And I say, that's not necessarily the case. So what, what would you ladies, um, how would you speak to that? I would say the first thing, Lisa, um, Dr. Connick, that you mentioned is just because they have a medical diagnosis does not automatically equate that they would get an IEP. It's really has to be an adverse impact in the educational setting. So it's really important because I do get a lot of families that say, I have an ADHD or an autism diagnosis. Why don't I have an IEP? So it's really important that you have to look at now, um, where is the student at now? What are the areas of deficit? What supports and accommodations and modification has the student, the student been provided by the team? I am all about, as Peppy mentioned, collaborative effort. I wanna make sure we wanna leave the student in the least restrictive environment, but we also know the least restrictive environment is different for every student, right? That's why there is a spectrum. So we wanna make sure that we look at what exactly does that student require? And if the team can't provide those supports, then that's when we put our written requests during the meeting that the student requires additional outside placement. Clearly what we wanna do is look at the continuum of placement within the district first. And if they don't have the supports the student requires, then we're gonna look at outside placement. I would I'm also sorry. add that oh. there's a, a data process. So just like with anything, um, you are providing a level of support or service and it might not be meeting the student's needs. We wanna look at the capacity of that school system, that program, could there be other resources that would be brought in to support that student in their home school? And not because we think so, but because we know so based on data. And so usually a therapeutic placement is considered when we have examined or exhausted all the resources available within that school setting. And when we found that when, we, when all of those resources have been explored or considered or tried, and we have data to support that the student still needed something else or something different that the school system could not provide. I think um, as it relates to um, something Camille shared at the beginning of our presentation, um, a public school might have 500 or 1,000 students that might be in the hallway you know, during a transition um, to go to lunch. And the school can't change that. But if that kind of activity would be problematic for a student, then you would look to a smaller setting because they're not going to have the same population of students, the same number of students. And that's something that no matter how hard the school tried to do, they can't change the number of students in the building. So it's looking at the resources from the school, from the building and identifying through data whether the school can meet that need. And if the answer is no to that, then we look for a private setting that has the capacity to do something different. And I just would like to add, because if parents are watching and they're new to this world, um, that point when a therapeutic placement is uh, proposed or 
determined to be the best setting. It can be a scary time for families that I've spoken to. So um, one thing to be aware is that there are a number of different programs and options. So you will have an opportunity to tour and talk to the specialists and the administrators at a number of different schools. Because again, like Wanda keeps saying, you, you as the parent knows your student best. And you're going to want to um, explore all the options available in which setting, because all the settings are just a little bit different. They're meeting maybe a different part of the spectrum need, or they meet students' needs in general differently. So you'll have an opportunity to discover which program or placement might be best for your student. And again, like Wanda said, you have a voice in that as the prog process progresses. I would agree wholeheartedly with that, Carrie. I think that, um, again, emphasizing the parent role as the advocate for their child is so critical. Um, and there are, there are nuances of differences between therapeutic day schools. I would encourage every parent that has, um, has that opportunity to visit uh, alternative programs, therapeutic day programs, to really ask a lot of questions um, about the daily routine, about the services, about the service delivery model, um, and about outcomes for the students that that school serves, I think is really, again, a critical component of looking at that alternative setting. I mean, that's a really good point. Um, I've had numerous clients over the years that we have outplaced. Um, and some we've gone through the continuum of placements, and some we've gone like, nope, it's not gonna work. We just need to go straight to it. And as a result of that, I actually created a checklist for my clients that they have when they're going to therapeutic day schools to review. And it's like a 50 page questions and some apply and so don't. And it's important. Um, one of the things that I tell families as Carrie mentioned, it is overwhelming when you're starting to visit all these places because you're like, what am I looking for? What's the right place? And the be best thing for parents that are watching, if you ever go down that route, is never look at aesthetics of the building. Look at the actual programming and staff and determine, is that the right placement for the student? Is my child gonna fit into that classroom? How do you vision your student? And ask a lot of questions. And I don't mean that because we have beautiful buildings and I'm not, I don't want that to be perceived. I know some parents sometimes look at a building and they're like, uh, I don't think this is the right placement. Don't look at the aesthetics, look at the programming, look at the, the staff, look at how they're managing the kids and envision your student in there. We have a mommy gut feeling and that's what I tell families, go with that mommy gut feeling. And the, the one other piece I'd like to add to that is a placement isn't a destination. So a lot of times when parents look at programs and consider whether my child will fit here, they worry that they can never leave. Um, and that, that like if I go to this place and even if my child needs this today, that doesn't mean that they're going to need it tomorrow or next year or in whatever amount of time. So we make educational decisions for kids based on their current needs. And then in the future, we'll make future decisions based on what they need at that time. But they are still members of their community. They are still members of their school district. And when it is appropriate to consider a return, that is always available. It's not like once you go, you can never return. That's a really important thing and things that parents really worry about. And Pepe, I agree, I'm, Pepe. I'm, oh, go I'm ahead, sorry. Pepe. No, I was just going to add, I'm sorry, um, and that's a really good point because I have had several students that have gone back to their home school and one of, I'm a big proponent, if the student's ability allows for them to have a voice as well, because that is always going to be the best thing, especially if you have a student that is struggling. I have a couple students in local districts now, and I'm telling the parents, take the student with you to visit. It's important that they get the buy-in because if we don't get the buy-in from the student, we can't just dictate it, right? Something is gonna spiral eventually. So I think it's important that we do, if the student's ability allows, 
that the student is involved in that process. And I have students that have gone back to the homeschool and it's been great. So it's really important. I wanna make two really good points. One, if the student is able to um, be part of that tour and part of that process, we have found that to be very successful. And when you answer a student's question versus a parent's question um, and you make that connection, having that student feel that they are part of the decision, but that also that they have ownership of being part of that school family, it's very critical. And then the second point that uh, you had brought up and Pepe, you as well, is that that return to district. And I think that's what, it, you know, when we talk about outcomes, we, we want our students to be able to reintegrate back into their homeschool district. And sometimes that's going to look like a, a little bit of a titration. It's not going to be that they finish the semester and then they go back full time. Does that happen? Yes, sometimes. But primarily, mostly what we see is a gradual transition back to homeschool so that the therapeutic day school can provide those supports um, with a student going back, taking one or two classes. We find that our districts are very, very um, collaborative in that process. So it's, it's an important piece of that transition. And as we're talking about the therapeutic school versus the traditional school, can you speak briefly about what are the types of individualized or unique programming that a therapeutic school can offer to students? Yeah, so um, primarily what happens in a therapeutic setting is that your student will get their services really all day long. So instead of the speech pathologist or an occupational therapist pushing into their classroom a certain number of hours every week, I'll just speak to turning point programming, our specialists are integrated in the classroom with their students. So if occupational therapy that week is pushing on, or working on push pull, maybe, their speech pathologist is gonna be working on push-pull language if the student is perhaps limited verbal skills. So all of their um, therapies and their academics become really intertwined and that helps our students have greater gains in our prim primary outcome areas, which are improved communication skills, nice, greater independence. Uh, nice there. And, um, yeah, I, I can tell they're nice and white, kind of like mine. Something just happened. Yeah. Um, the third program area is um, really we're trying to improve socially appropriate behaviors. So those are the three things that the team is working on and a student's team in a therapeutic setting is usually, I guess we would say closer to the student. So um, you're gonna have a smaller number of, a clinician will have a smaller number of students on their caseload. They're gonna also have a special education teacher and at Turning Points Therapeutic Day School, every student also has a full-time aid to ensure that their programming is happening throughout the day and really integrated in everything we're doing. Uh, Carrie, that was very well said. And I, I agree, Those that level of um, therapeutic intervention throughout the day, from the very beginning of the day when they get off the bus to the very end of the day when they get on back on the bus, is um, that level of intensity is permeated throughout the, the uh, the day and across disciplines. So for example, um, at our, at our um, little friend school programs at Kretze Academy, uh, zones of regulation is something that is uh, permeated throughout the uh, building. There are, there are visual supports in every classroom with zones, in the hallways and in, in all of the therapy rooms um, with options of how to move from the red zone to um, the green zone. Um, so again, just being able to integrate that program throughout the day across all settings and disciplines. Thank you, ladies. Here's an interesting one that I think is important. Um, transition planning. We're, we're always planning for transition out of school eventually. Um, when should families start thinking about transition planning and what are the components of a good transition plan? And this, and this starts earlier on and, you know, I, I think. Um, 
and not necessarily when you're about to graduate high school. Right, and okay. I would love to jump in just a little bit. And and I know that Pepe and Wanda certainly have lots to say and probably Brianna, you as well and Carrie. Um, for us, transition starts when we first receive a student. You know, when you're five, six and seven years old, we need to be looking at what are you good at doing? What do you like doing? And um, so for example, one student may really have some strong math skills or some categorizing skills and reading skills. And maybe that's something that goes towards library science later on. Or maybe another student really enjoys cleaning and organizing and doing um, vocational job tasks, cleaning the tables. So we really want to make sure that we're supporting that skill development, but at a young age. And, and um, again, that 14 and a half is the legal age where you really need to legally begin transition services. But I think that we have a responsibility to begin looking at that skill development at a very early age. And I would add, so in, um, in the state of Illinois, it starts, it must be in place by 14 and a half. The federal law says 16. So it, this is one area where Illinois is a little bit ahead of the game which is wonderful to hear. Um, but an annual review period is 12 months. So if your child is going to be turning 14 and a half during the 12 months of the IEP, a transition plan could be drafted at 13 years, 10 months, because somewhere during that 12 months, 14 and a half will happen and we need to be prepared. So that could be like seventh grade and a lot of people are surprised at the thought of thinking about post-school outcomes for a student that might not have even finished middle school. But I fully support um, what Camille said, because think about a professional athlete. They don't start playing professional you know, sports um, in college. They've been working on their professional sports career since they were little kids. So anything that we can connect that's that a student might be good at or passionate about that we can reinforce and then formalize in that transition plan at the earliest possible point, that's gonna drive IEP services into their future. And if I can add one of the things um, for those parents that follow me and have heard me say this, I am a big proponent of starting as early as possible. When I have a student, even in elementary, um, you know, the whole purpose of the federal law of IDEA is to prepare the students for further education, employment, and independent living. And when I have a young elementary, they're like, why am I thinking that? Well, the whole purpose of the IEP is year after year, we have established some goals that we want the student to meet and to close the, have the deficit areas, whatever skill set that they require. But I'm always thinking ahead as Camille mentioned, is looking at the opportunities that the students like and enjoy. Motivation is a key factor, right, throughout the whole learning. But I also look at the IEP from a different perspective, making sure we are preparing the students for the future. I am big on functional goals, especially in the middle school and high school. Um, yes, they have a curriculum to uh, meet the requirements to graduate if that is the path the students are going, but there is no reason why we can't individualize a plan for a student with still having some functional goals. So I think transition starts to me, even though the legal requirement in the state of Illinois is 14 and a half, executive functioning, let's start early. Let's start that very early. It's a life skill. It's something they're going to need for life. Why do we have to wait till 14 and a half? So my uh, philosophy is always starting as early as possible. So when I work with my clients, that is what I'm working on, preparing the students for the future. I wanted to also add just for parents watching, this is another opportunity where your um, voice means so much to us uh, on the team side because you know your student best and you know what they like to do. And sometimes it's something they really prefer at home and maybe they don't have an opportunity to do it at school. But that's where um, a school like Turning Point or Little Friends can be really creative on how we can build on those interests because we all wanna do something we love and really get creative together. So I always remember a dad telling me once that his son loved to draw circles. So maybe that meant we could find him a task 
where he was stirring because he would be making a circle for a while and that would be something he would really enjoy. So those are like the kind of creative thoughts, but we have to know first from families what they're seeing at home and all of those notes, like Wanda said earlier, they need to be part of the record throughout their academic career so that we can access them and get creative on how that might transition into employment later on. And I would I did, add to oh. that, I'm sorry, Bran, the, uh, what Carrie's referencing and the part of the IEP is the parent educational concerns, a parent input statement. Be sure for any parent that is watching it now or later, that is the area where you want your voice. What is your vision and mission for the student? Um, things like the likes and dislikes, anything like that is important. And parents don't even know that they can put that into the IEP. So I want to make sure that parents know that is the key section that you can put that in there and you can put it ahead of time. Um, I, I work with a lot of providers and I train them. Ask your parents for that information ahead of time, because if you want to build a collaborative team, that is going to get you that because the, then the parent knows that you're asking for their feedback and their input. Very key. And I just wanted to add from my uh, both my perspective now in higher ed, but also my experience in in K-12 as a special educator that um, sometimes the transition plan can be the weakest part of an IEP, I think, because um, we are so focused on the now and the, like what's right in front of us and which is very, very important in meeting the child where they are, um, that what can happen is we look at the transition plan and just set a goal. And goals are important, but I would really stress um, that it should be more expansive than that. It should include, um, as Wanda and Carrie mentioned, skills, like what skills are needed to get to that goal? We need to look at the goal. So if the goal is, um, you know, we'll attend college, let's say that those might be some of the students coming to us. Well, what are the skills that it's going to take from age, you know, whenever you want to start, but, you know, um, it, let's say at that 14 and a half, you need to examine, um, you know, the skill sets that are going to, to be necessary. And then you examine um, a game plan of how are we going to address those skills? How are we going to support them? And I think, um, you know, I, I don't want to bad mouth IEP teams by any means, but what happens is we just get so focused on the now and oftentimes a transition plan comes at the end of a long IEP meeting. And so it just sort of is like, great, we have some goals and then we move on. And then next year we just either adapt those goals or write new ones and then move on. But we're never really tying in this, the necessary skills and the plan from how to get from where we are now, which were our IEP goals focus on to where we want to be in the transition um, you know, later down the road. Brianne, and that's a great point. A parent, again, the transition plan, and I'm part of the um, task force. In fact, we have a meeting tomorrow looking at that transition because I have a 17-year-old on the spectrum. And as I'm looking, I'm like, where are the resources? And I am very active in the community, but the information and the resources are not readily available, which is why I become involved with this task force at Springfield, because we need to have, make sure the parents are aware, what are those steps? But I agree with you, having them embedded, because that is part of the IEP. They have to have it. And a lot of times parents don't even know that they can ask for a job coach. What supports and services does the student need to prepare them for the future? Um, and I see that that even school teams, a lot of times they don't even know. They just write a goal and they move on. So again, as a parent, ask questions because that is why um, the supports are there. So especially for transition. The transition plan should be the foundation, if you think of a house, um, the transition plan should be a foundation for the house and that's the rest of the IEP. So if there's not a tangible, logical connection between the goals and the transition plan, let's circle back and make those connections because that is, it's sort of like taking a road trip but not knowing where you wanna end up. The transition plan should point to that future destination and the goals should be the means that they're going to get there. So that connection is critical. It shouldn't be a separate part of the IEP that you talk about at the end. 
it should be an integrated part that relates to the whole document. And a lot of parents don't know that most schools have a vocational transition coordinator. And that person not, is not always involved in part of the IEP. A lot of times when an advocate comes, then we can ask for the person. But again, the parents should know that there's always somebody designated at the school to help with that transition. And that is somebody that you can involve and have part of the IEP as well. Thank you, ladies. And as we're talking about a, a transition planning, what are the needs of students post high school and how can those be met? Well, that's a big gap right now that we're seeing, right? A lack of, um, and I don't wanna say lack of resources, but it's a big gap that we're seeing um, all the way around, especially after they turn 22, when they, you know, again, everything stops. Um, again, another of my um, missions down in Springfield, trying to advocate that we finish out the year, it doesn't stop at the, um, you know, when they turn 22. Um, and I know that's passed, but it hasn't been finalized. I think Wanda, it's before, can you speak to that? I have families that don't know about this post 20, the, the 22 space. Yeah, so basically um, the day before they turn 22, typically what happens, the services end. It doesn't matter if it's in January, February, August, June, July, it stops. And what we're advocating for is that they pass that the students can finish out the school year versus stopping in the middle of the school year which makes sense, really. A lot of our students transition. They need structure. They need that routine. And to just all of a sudden just cut it off, it just seems like it's, it's not right. Um, so I think it's important for parents to know, but I think that continuing to look to other services, there are services that are provided out there post high school, but I think the planning that you start early is what's gonna determine where that post high school is that does that make sense if you're not planning ahead then you're going to be struggling and scrambling at the end if i could add to that um as a part of the transition plan there's a section for connection to community or adult service agencies so a lot of times um as as we've mentioned there might be a vocational coordinator or a transition coordinator from the district who might come, but you can ask that outside agencies be invited and you don't have to wait until a student is 20 or 21. Um, many times that's what high schools will say. Um, even in transition planning for a high school freshman, they'll say, oh, we'll talk about that your junior or senior year, or we'll talk about that when you're in the transition program, which is a program that's usually designed for students that are 18 to 22. But there's nothing in the statute that says you have to wait until that time. So if you know of a program, and by you I mean any family, that you think would be a, a good program, a college program that might have supports for students with disabilities, you can ask that a representative from that program be invited to your child's transition meeting so that again, the high school team might just not be aware of the supports from an outside program. So invite those people, they are welcome to come and they could come for a student who is a freshman in high school. So the more we again advance plan and then include other representatives, other experts that can help to make a connection between the end of school-based services and the beginning of adult services, we don't have to wait to the end to make that invitation. And I think that's a really critical point. And can I speak? Oh, go ahead, go Carrie. Ahead. No, no, I, you go ahead. I was thinking of you because we could both mention our, our camp. So Turning Point has a six week camp in the summer for 16 and up. And it is working again on communication, independence, socially appropriate behaviors and employability skills. So you can find out more information about that on our website, but um, it's essentially six weeks. And it, once you're 16, you'd be eligible to come join us. And it's a good opportunity to start working on specific transition skills. We also have a program 
for um, after high school for students that are less impacted. And it's a, called Autism Career Connection. It's in partnership with Parents Alliance. And you spend a semester at Turning Point really learning employability skills and communication skills related to employment. And then your second semester, you are already placed in an internship for work. So that's called Autism Career Connection. And that's another opportunity for families that are looking for um, employment options for their students. And then Turning Point also has a pilot program for our therapeutic day students post 22. Those um, currently this pilot's only open to students that are in Turning Point's transition program. And then they age into this adult pilot and two of the four in there are actually employed now. Um, with one of our enterprises out of our facility. So, um, so they do exist to Pepe's point and getting involved early in where your student might transition to and what specific skills they'll need to make that transition is obviously a really, a, a really good idea. Yeah, to just add on to what Carrie said um, and, and back to the question of what are the needs of students post high school? I think the biggest thing um, that students with autism struggle with um, is a lack of reference points, a lack of that concrete um, understanding of, of some what's coming. And so any programs, any resources um, that you can find, that the IEP can find, that allow them to have reference points um, and experiential learning um, exposure to um, a college campus. So that, that's what our camps are designed for, is for college-bound students to actually have exposure to the campus, to live in the residence halls, to eat in the dining halls, so that it goes from an abstract idea to a more concrete idea. Um, and then, you know, if, if it's not college, having those experiences um, in the, the work setting, so, you know, in uh, employability skills, because um, a lot of these things, you know, for our students are really kind of um, abstract ideas that other people are talking about that they are not really able to grasp onto. And so when they get that experience, it makes more sense to them. It can bring their anxiety down because they now have something that they can refer back to and say, okay, I understand. I've been on a college campus or I've been to the work site. And, and the anxiety comes down, and, and we know that when the anxiety comes down, so much more productivity and growth can take place. And so I really think, depending on the individual and what their path is, just making sure that they have um, some familiarity with what we're, we're wanting and, and the goals that we're setting for, for post-graduation um, or post-transition program, just making sure they're familiar with the options that are out there for them ahead of time. I want to add one point that's really, really important and almost never discussed by school teams. So students with IEP services can graduate with their class, can, and by graduate, I mean participate in the graduation ceremony. They can wear a cap and gown, they can walk across the stage. But what schools sometimes don't clarify for parents is if the family takes the diploma, accepts the document, then they are in essence ending school-based services. But a student can walk across the stage, wear the cap and gown, participate with their class, and not take the actual diploma from the school district. If they are eligible to receive transition services, they can continue to receive transition services up until that 22nd birthday and the diploma just waits in a file cabinet until the student is ready to take it. Um, that sometimes isn't clarified. And then parents don't realize that they've lost something by accepting the, the actual diploma. I've had students in transition services who also attend college. So they might spend a portion of their day at their high school or in a transition program, take a class or two at a community college or a junior college, and they just pick up the diploma when they're really ready to leave. So the idea of you know, celebrating a child's graduation and potentially taking or not taking the diploma 
can be a point of confusion and can discontinue special ed services earlier than it should otherwise be. Thank you, ladies. Um, for sake of time, I'm kind of watching. If there are no questions, I want to make sure people have an opportunity to co connect with all of you. I know you put your contact information in the chat, but would we like to go around and give an indication of how people can get in touch with you? Brianne? Yeah, you can um, reach me. My phone number is 630-844-4209. And my email address is bjonathan at aurora.edu. And Wanda. Thank you. Um, the easiest is at wandamaloneeducationalservices.com. My cell phone number is 630-803-8471. If you look on Facebook and Instagram, you'll find me. My email is a long one, so you certainly can find me through my cell and I can text you my email. Carrie? Yes, um, so I do recommend you go right to our website. It's Turning Point, and Point has an E on the end, so it's turningpointautismfoundation.org. There's actually a new slider on there that says, is Turning Point right for my child? And you can go right through there to get a little bit more information on our programs. If you want to reach out to me directly, it's C Provenzale, C-P-R-O-V-E-N-Z-A-L-E, -E, again, at Turning Point with an E on the end, a for autism, F for foundation.org or 630-615-6027. And I'd be happy to connect. Peppy. Um, any family is uh, can contact me at 847-903-7778. My email is my first name, P-E-P-I at B as in bridge, E as in education, and then the word advocacy.com. And I offer any prospective family a free 60 minute consultation to talk about the needs of their child. Camille? Hi, um, I have just changed my uh, name to my email address. So you can see that right there. It's also in the chat box, uh, but our main number uh, or my direct line I'll give is 630-281-6920. And as I said, that's my email address um, right there in the uh, on the screen. Thank you, Camille. And ours is uh, conicandassociates.com. So our uh, probably best our website, www.conicandassociates.com or info at conicandassociates.com. And I want to thank everybody for joining us today and sharing. This has been a wealth of wonderful information about education in autism. I thank you all for, for joining us and for sharing your insights. Um, I also want to mention that um, we have our third session on multidisciplinary therapeutic supports next week on April 26th. I hope you will tune in and join us. Um, and again, thank you to our panel of experts for presenting today. And thank you for attending. Thank you.